we're ready to talk about the lungs. And I've labeled this lungs one because we're going to have uh, different lessons on the lungs. Right now I want to concentrate more on anatomy than anything. You could also call this a discussion on the pulmonary system. And what is the pulmonary system? Well, we're going to find out it's the airways all the way from the nasal cavity or mouth. You can breathe, in, an animal can breathe in both ways. Uh, so we have all the airways and there's many branches we'll be talking about. And then there's the paired lungs and then the diaphragm, which we know from previous discussion perhaps that it's skeletal muscle. And if you know it's skeletal muscle, then you know it can't contract by itself like the heart needs no neural input. But the diaphragm must have a nerve, or you can think of it as a wire coming in to tell it to contract. Okay, so this beautiful diagram that somebody, some artist has drawn, way better than I can, shows the pulmonary system and a few other body parts. So I want to name these to make sure we're all in the same boat here. Okay, well, you know, maybe you don't know, the trachea, that's this red apparatus here and let me get down it's also called the windpipe and so the trachea is formed by cartilaginous rings it doesn't really change its diameter much it can a little but essentially it's always open okay even when you dissect an animal you'll find the trachea has a lumen okay now that's opposed to the esophagus which here I'm going to put up here and then I'm going to point to it. But the esophagus, that's the tube that carries food and liquid from the mouth down to the stomach. And if I had to say where the esophagus is, it's dorsal to the trachea. Okay, so it's kind of outlined there in a very faint line. But you'll notice the trachea is more ventral than the esophagus. Okay, another thing we're going to point out are the lungs. They're in the thorax, of course. So I'll put thorax here someplace. I don't have to uh, draw a line. You know where the thorax is. And then, of course, the heart is drawn in the chest cavity. Okay, the thorax, the thoracic cavity. And then the last part of the lungs, uh, the pulmonary system, I should say, is the diaphragm and maybe I'll draw a line here because you know the diaphragm is uh, the skeletal muscle and maybe what I'll do is outline it here rather than point to it here it is right there that's the diaphragm hopefully you can see that when it contracts it would enlarge the thoracic cavity so what I'm saying is if it moved back this way a little bit, I'll put a little arrow there, you could see where the chest cavity would enlarge, and that helps draw in air. But you know the other thing it helps? It helps venous blood return to the heart. Okay, and our last point here, which is a point important one, is I want to talk about the phrenic nerve, and I'm going to put it up here by the brain. Now, the phrenic nerve is the nerve that carries messages from the brain stem to the diaphragm and it tells then the diaphragm when to contract so i'm going to draw a little line maybe i'll put it in blue and the brain uh, the phrenic nerve sorry comes out of the brain stem and leaves the spinal cord at about c2 or 3 something like that so then what had happened it would go down here and it's got many branches, but I'm just going to draw one, and it's going to innervate the diaphragm. So back up here, if you notice, and I'm going to be pointing out here, uh, let me get my laser pointer started, it leaves the spinal cord. Now I'm talking about the phrenic nerves. It leaves at about C2 or 3. It depends on what animal you're talking about. So imagine the spinal cord. Now watch my red line. The spinal cord gets cut here. Let's say we're cutting it at the animal has an accident or the person has an accident and it gets cut here. Do you know respiration would not be interfered with? Because why? 
the cable is still intact, the blue cable. Okay? So, if you go up further, more cranial, and there's an accident that cuts the spinal cord here, you're going to cut the cable or the wire, whatever you want to call it, the phrenic nerve that goes to the diaphragm, and breathing will not be possible. Spontaneous breathing will not be possible because the diaphragm needs the neural input. Okay, and I, I always want you to remember that you can pause these presentations or go back and review them and take notes because if you're taking a test on this material, I move too fast for you to really write everything down, but I know you have the pause button. Let's look at some real lung tissue. It should be pink. That, I think you would agree, is pink. Here's the trachea, I believe, here. I'm not very close, but it looks like it's between the two lungs, and we're going to find out in another diagram that the trachea brings air down and then it branches. But lungs should be pink in most cases, and by the way, if you did cut off a little piece of lung and put it in water, it should float. Now, that's called the float test. It's not perfect, but if a lung floats, it means it's probably taken at least one breath. Okay, here's somebody's diagram. I'm going to enlarge it a little bit. And you know, then, that cranial is over here. Okay, cranial, because then... The trachea is only one pipe, cartilaginous rings, but then it splits off going to the left and right lungs, and that's called the bronchus. Okay, there's a left bronchus and a right bronchus. Well, then you notice there's a lot of divisions. Okay, many divisions, and they're called uh, branches, and it's often thought there, that there's about 22 generations of branching. That means Here's one branch, right? And then you get here, there's another one, that's two, there's three, and it doesn't show all the branches, but about 22 branches. Air never moves in a straight line. It's always banging against the sidewalls, and we're going to be talking about that later, why that's important. But then the smaller, vest, the smaller airways are called bronchioles, and then finally, we get down to a closed-end sac. This is a plural alveoli. So there's many alveoli. And if you want to spell alveolus, replace that I with a U-S. Maybe there's another diagram with the alveolus spelling. Okay, I think by now you can tell I'm a visual learner, and I really believe that people learning this material should look at many, many diagrams drawn by many, many artists, because everyone has its own little beautiful things. I'm going to start here with the trachea. It's always open. And now we're showing the trachea going into the thoracic cavity, which is bounded by ribs. Uh, there's muscles between the ribs. Those are called intercostal muscles. In some animals, they do help with breathing. But we're going to find, well, I should say that the diaphragm, of course, is the main inspiratory muscle. We'll be talking about that. But you can see the many branches, the heart's not drawn to size because it would be bigger, but they, this artist wanted to concentrate on the lungs. So then you can pause this, read it, draw notes, whatever. I've got another diagram to go to. Okay, this artist said, hey, I'm going to label one side, and they've done a little bit different label. They've got, of course, the trachea, the windpipe. They've said this is cartilage. When you get down to the smaller airways, you could call it a terminal bronchial. Terminal means I'm at the end. Okay? And there's all kinds of little segments branching off. There's um, the misspelling of the alveolus. Okay? And that's the other thing. If you're a, a good learner, you can pick out the misspelling. So there's how you spell alveolus. When you say alveolus, now that's in blue here. When you say alveolus, you're talking about one of those air sacs, okay? If you want to talk about all of them, you put an I in place of the U.S. Okay, so let's talk about breathing a little bit. You know when an animal is running, 
there are more breaths per minute. There's more oxygen taking, taken in. There's more carbon, carbon dioxide expelled. And so let's talk about inspiration and expiration. Inspiration, of course, is taking in air. And in most of our animals, most of the mammals, that's an active process. That means some muscles have to contract to make the thorax bigger. Expiration is where air is leaving the trachea, right, leaving the lungs. And it tends to be passive in most animals. Maybe the horse not. It might have to contract some of those intercostal muscles to help expel all the air to get a good um, exhale. But for most cases, inspiration is active, expiration is passive. Okay, so let's again look at some lungs because I want to point out now, here is a pair of lungs with a heart, more to, you know, obviously that's the actual size. There's the trachea, it's always going to be open. Remember, lungs are usually pink to, of some sort. But these seem to be kind of deflated, and that's what you should always know. Whenever an animal's dissected or has died, because expiration is passive and it's like the recoil of things that have been stretched, whenever you find a dead animal or an animal that you're dissecting, the lungs are always in the exhaled state. So you don't get really their true, the true picture of what they are as size-wise. So I found a nice little picture of a pair of horse lungs that they've actually inflated. I think you get the idea there. Look at that. Wow. So here's one lung, here's the other. And look how large that can be when the animal takes a full, big inspiration. Okay. See how I always try to maybe bring in some other topics as long as we're looking at whatever we're supposed to be looking at? Here's a nice little diagram of, well, not a diagram. Well, yeah, it is a picture, an image of an actual dissection specimen, dissection. So there over on the left there, I say dissection, dissection, I guess, is a better way to pronounce that. And you do notice everything is kind of dull color, nothing's really as in the living animal as far as color goes, structure it is. And so whenever you dissect an animal a lot of times, you're working with a preserved specimen. And this is good because in some cases there's pros and cons. Okay, so the uh, good thing about it is you can dissect a little bit, come back later, put it away, put it in a refrigerator, it's preserved. It's not going to decay. And in this preserved specimen, we have the phrenic nerve. And it branches, so they're calling this the right phrenic nerve. Okay. And if you know this is the diaphragm over here, then you know over here is cranial. And they've taken probably the lungs out because here's space. There wouldn't be space here. The lung would be right there. And what they've done and they've used one of my favorite instruments, a blunt probe. This probe is rounded, so when you're dissecting, you're not really cutting anything. And you tend to leave tissue intact. You're kind of like moving things rather than cutting. Well, you can see that, first of all, a nerve is kind of nondescript, isn't it? It looks like a big piece of floss, really. But it's going to be carrying action potentials from the brain stem down to the diaphragm, which is skeletal muscle. The skeletal muscle will only contract when a nerve impulse comes down. If this was cut, as we previously mentioned, then you would not get any contraction of the diaphragm. So this is a preserved specimen. Okay, and I just want to move some of this stuff out of the way because then I want to show you a fresh, fresh specimen and how color is more realistic. So here we go. Now this is a fresh one. And the, one of the things I want to point out is the terminology necropsy versus autopsy. And I'll put it right there. There we can see, we can all see it. So when you say an animal has undergone a necropsy, that means you're examining it to determine its cause of death. And you're looking at an animal. 
So animals undergo necropsy. You often read um, in the newspaper that a person that was found dead or died underwent an autopsy. So autopsy tends to be reserved for the human race, examining a body to see why it died, versus a necropsy, which is examining a, an animal to see why it died. And here, I just want to point out, there's the phrenic nerve, but look how fresh everything looks. This is actually lung tissue. It's a little red, but it, it's, it's fine. Probably in the live animal, it was brighter. But there's my blunt probe again. That's not my finger, but somebody's using an instrument that I like because you can probe, not cut things, and there's the nerve. And here's one last take-home message from this uh, module lesson whatever you call it is nerves are pretty nondescript that would be so easy to cut that thing by mistake and say i can't find any nerves thank you